Making these films, I was often told it's impossible to track Shakespeare down. But that's not to say you shouldn't try. In recent years, I've pursued historical characters into the wildest places of the world, from Afghanistan to Amazonia. But in a way, this was an even greater challenge. Would it work back home? Would the English landscape, the living witnesses and the documents help us get closer to the most mysterious man in our history? And set him in his times. And it was out in the wild landscape of the Forest of Arden in Warwickshire, the roots of Shakespeare's family, that I first felt I was touching his world. Coming across lonely houses, now tranquil, but then the focus of bitter conflicts of conscience, battles between old and new. His was a time when religion split the country apart, and that revolution still seems to me to be the key to Shakespeare's background. We know very little about what went on at these meetings in these houses, largely because they were secret. The Jesuits came disguised as gentlemen, wrapped in their black cloaks with their priestly vestments hidden away, along with their other paraphernalia, like this. This is a, a little travelling box of a, a priest of that period. You see the Lamb of God there on the lid. And inside, the containers for the holy oil for baptizing children and uh, also for receiving new converts and uh, anointing the aged and the sick. There. And here's a, a Catholic rosary from that period, treasured as gifts by uh, loyal families. But the Campion mission carried something else with them. This, the contract and testament of the soul. It's a, a profession of faith for loyal Catholics to be made in the presence of the Blessed Virgin Mary, my angel guardian and all the celestial court. And you witnessed it there and you kept it with you at all times. They brought copies of this with them and it proved so popular that within a few months there were requests for three or thousand more to be sent over from the continent. And why it's so interesting in the Shakespeare story is that in 1757, a handwritten copy of this was discovered, carefully hidden away between the rafters and the tiles in the Shakespeare birthplace in Henley Street. You can't abstract religion and spiritual practices from the ordinary weave and web of life in the 16th century. Um, and what the, happened at the Reformation, of course, was this religious, cultural, social, political revolution which changed completely the way that people were supposed to not only see themselves in the world but, but relate to, to one another, but how they were to view God in the way that he worked in, in, the, in the world. And, uh, Obviously, uh, at the heart of the Catholic understanding was this idea that, that, that the church is an unbroken chain of saints and sinners, that everyone is bound in a communion of love, both the living and the dead, and the whole purpose is that they all help one another to the fullness of life in the presence of God. Um, and what happened at the Reformation is that that, was, that idea was um, destroyed, um, it seems to have been, for the most part, certainly in the early years, imposed from above, and people um, didn't necessarily acquiesce in this revolution, and some people actively resisted. But the number of people who actively resisted were small compared with the general population. It is required. You do awake your faith. In some of Shakespeare's plays, you can see why his contemporaries thought they were touched by the old religion.
This is the last scene of Winter's Tale. Proceed. No foot shall stir. Music. Awake her. Strike. It is time. Descend. Be stone no more. Approach. Strike all that look upon with marvel. Come. Stir. Nay, come away. Bequeath to death your numbness, for from him dear life redeems you. You perceive she stirs. Start not. Do not shun her until you see her die again, for then you kill her double. Nay, present your hand. When she was young, you wooed her. By an age is she become the suitor? Oh, she's warm. If this be magic, let it be an art lawful as eating. London was the centre of the theatre, and censorship was a fact of life that all dramatists had to face. And that took us to a wonderful surviving medieval building at St John's Gate. So when you'd written your play, you had to come to the office of the censor, which is out, outside the city here in Clerkenwell. It was here in the old precinct of the Priory of the Knights of St. John of Jerusalem. And inside the gate, this was all the precinct here with the church over there, and this is where they would have come. It was here at St. John's Gate that Professor Andy Gurr described to me the hoops that playwrights had to jump through to get their plays passed for public performance and what a fine line Shakespeare had to tread. He was putting on stage the things that people would make terrible use of. People would see what he himself, on the face of it, um, could do quite innocently, but of course Shakespeare knew far too much to be innocent in that sense. But. He wrote a play which became the allowed book. That was the word they used, the allowed book. And that allowed book was enormously valuable to the company. When Sir George Buck or Henry Tilney, the censor, signed it, as in this case we have it, 31st of October 1611, this second maiden's tragedy, for it hath no name inscribed, may, with the reformations, be acted publicly, G. Buck. Signed on the book itself, that made it the allowed book, and it was the most valuable commodity that company then had, because they could act it one way or another, cut, <laughs> reformed, modified, but um, exactly as he himself allowed it. That's and the allowed book became the thing that was, to them, the license. So that's what they've come for. That's bums on seats and box office takings. The actors had no problem with the Master of the Rebels because in the end it was his neck on the line. Um, <laughs> his neck? His neck, yeah, not, yeah. not theirs, yeah. but his. Yeah. In the first performances of Henry IV, Sir John Falstaff is, is called Sir John Oldcastle. Why did he change the name of the Falstaff? Because the Master of the Rebels was subject to the Lord Chamberlain. And in 1597, the Lord Chamberlain was a man called Cobham, whose ancestor had been Sir John Oldcastle, a Protestant martyr executed in the end by Henry V. And Shakespeare had been, in some sense, mocking, mocking the man, mocking the ancestors. So somebody then puts pressure on Shakespeare's company to either rewrite the play or to change the name of the character. Not just somebody, the master of the rebels. Because yeah. the Master of the Rebels' his boss was the Lord Chamberlain. The Lord Chamberlain was a man whose ancestor was 
Guess who? Sir John Oldcastle. I was lately here in the end of a displeasing play. <laughs> and that explains the author's message at the end of Henry IV, Part Two. Any resemblance to persons living or dead is coincidental. With Sir John in it. <laughs> <laughs> Unless already he'd be killed with your hard opinions. <laughs> um, for Old Castle died a martyr, and this is not the man. And so kneel down before you. But indeed, to pray for the Queen. <laughs> Thank you. Travelling through Warwickshire today, it's hard to imagine the degree of social unrest in Shakespeare's time. And we came across some wonderful unnoticed social detail from his late teens in the book of John Fisher in Warwick Town Hall. I'll put it down on the cushion to protect the cover. Gosh, wonderful. So this is your predecessor's book? Yes, very much his uh, supplementary minute book, really. In its original binding. That's right. And uh, did he, would he have sat up at night, sort of... Scribbling these back at home. Well, they it? certainly look. The handwriting is so dreadful. <laughs> I feel that he probably did it by a very sort of guttering candle late yeah, yeah, at night. Yeah, yeah. Oh, an amazing gallery of characters, isn't it? Sheep drovers and labourers, veterans from Ireland, pickpockets, coney catchers, and bawdy baskets, as the Elizabethans would say. <laughs> look at this. Dorothy Green, alias Cousining Doll. This is straight out of Falstaff, isn't it? Doll tear sheet. This is the list of the poor. Joan Welsh, a lame beggar of 60 years. Mm. John Harbert's idiot child, yeah. begging aged 18. That's this right. is almost like poor Tom in King is, Lear. Yeah. Fisher actually lists the people who were well enough off to pay a poor rate to support the poor. The people who were able to look after themselves but not pay a poor rate, and the people who needed poor relief. And it's nearly a quarter of the population of the town centre. So that was the world in which Shakespeare emerged as a top writer, based in London, but also touring the length and breadth of the land. And we took the Royal Shakespeare Company to places we know his company played. One of them was Leicester Guildhall. Here, in a space in which Shakespeare acted, they had to work out how he might have done it. So everybody has to sit, turn around their chair. That's interesting. That side. So which, what are we doing this side? Uh, this side, Romeo and Juliet. Oh, obviously. So this is absolutely genuine Shakespearean location here, one of the few places still completely intact where we know they're played. And you do one show for the mayor and the aldermen, like town councils everywhere, they, they expected the freebie, you know. Okay. And so you didn't get paid for that, they would give you a, a, a little consideration. But, and then you did another public show where you... And here in the rehearsals, we got a privileged insider's glimpse into the actor's craft, from Hamlet to Richard III. Mark me. I will. Lend thy serious hearing to what I shall unfold. Speak, I'm bound to hear. I am thy father's spirit, doomed for a certain term to walk the night and by the day confined to fast in fires. The serpent that did sting thy father's heart now wears his crown. Oh, a prophetic soul, my uncle. Absolutely right. We also looked in more detail at how Shakespeare made it as a young man. And maybe this is him, aged 24. What fascinated me was his rivalry with his brilliant young contemporary, Christopher Marlowe the author of Dr. Faustus, which was played back then by Marlowe's star actor, Edward Allen. Was this the face that launched a thousand ships 
and burnt the topless towers at Ilium. Sweet Helen, make me immortal with a kiss. Here will I dwell, for heaven is in these lips, and all is dross that is not Helen. It must have been intimidating, wasn't it? Because there was this kind of great leading actor, Edward Allen, and Marlowe writing these enormous, great, epic screen plays with these mighty lines that have, and you know, they have this dreadful, sure. monotonous kind of beat to them. Don't yeah. They? Oh, yeah. And uh, I mean, uh, well, a kind of jagged text. Yeah. Right. I suppose you know, it's yeah. bum, 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 and it is so knackering. <laughs> <laughs> and added to which. The gestures alone, I mean, just one gesture that went on and on and on. And then another <laughs> gesture that went on and on. And as an actor, you'd think, God, I must get into some other style of acting. <laughs> <laughs> it's, 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 it it uh, is, it's Hamlet's advice to the players. He's sort of saying, don't act exactly. like that. Isn't what what yeah. does Hamlet say? Don't, don't say, well, he says all that thing about out Heroding Herod and yeah. don't saw the air too yeah. much with your hands. Mm. So you this know. is the Edward Allen That's style Edward Allen's he's talking yeah. about. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. Think yeah. So. So, so he's trying to make it more, well, I, he wouldn't have ever used the word naturalistic, but he's trying to make the words uh, articulate uh, in the way that th that humans think and speak, rather than creating the great sweeping epic line that would fill the Rose Theatre. Yeah. You can tell Shakespeare and Marlowe apart just like that, can you? Anybody who yeah. says that Marlowe, uh, that Shakespeare was Marlowe, that Marlowe wrote Shakespeare, ask any actor and they'll tell you it's not true. No way. Difficult. I mean, it's fanciful thinking, but if one... I mean, John Barton, a specialist in Shakespeare, knows more about this, but he does a little party piece of reciting Shakespeare in what he would think was the local accent. My nearest to it that I can recall with tunes living around him, and I come from Yorkshire myself, but is of a kind of singing, you know, that when people talk, so, how for a muse of fire, the Buddhist send the broad his heaven of invention, kingdom for a stage, princess to act, and monarchs to the eldest wedding scene, so that you get a tune. Whereas, um, now, clear the triple regions of the air, you know, and it, it's not, I mean, I know you can get away with it, that's yeah, just a yeah. huge over yeah. example, but, But it's you know. more Lenny Henry than Laurence Olivier. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. This is a, a copy of the first pages of the first folio. And I After our show in Leicester, Greg Doran told us all about Shakespeare's company, the Magnificent Eleven, with whom he worked for 25 years. Shakespeare, containing all his comedies, histories and tragedies, truly set forth according to their first original, the names of the principal actors in all these plays. It begins, of course, with William Shakespeare, uh, and Burbage comes next. Burbage, um, who from 95 right the way through to his death in, I think, 1619, was, stayed with the company. He played all the great parts. He was Malvolio, he was Richard III, he was Othello, he was Lear. He played Lear when he was 37, you know. Imagine getting that line of parts year after year written for you. John Hemmings, who's the next one on the list, was the sort of business manager of the company, as far as we know. Hemmings and his friend Condell were the two people responsible for the collected works. William Sly, interesting man, he seems to have been a bit of a ladies' man. When Sly's will was uh, witnessed, it was witnessed by several illiterate women. Um, whether they were his, just various of his friends, I, I, I don't know. But you get a kind of a picture of the company, don't you? We have, you know, we have William Slyes in our own company. Um, Nid Field was, was one of the boy actors and was very beautiful. William Shakespeare himself, that tradition has it, is, was an actor. He played old Adam. We know he played old Adam in, in As You Like It. Um, and it said he played the ghost of Hamlet's father. Pretty reassuring that he did write all the, part, the best parts of himself, though, isn't it? Well, maybe he did. <laughs> no one would let Nobody him. would let him play them. Well, maybe. No, well, he, no, no, no. Well, yeah. <laughs> but maybe it, he was. I, I, I think it's because he was directing them. You see. Yeah. So oh, I see. I think he was having more. We know where the money goes. Shakespeare was a director. So there you are. A few bonus insights into the greatest acting company that ever was. King Brought to life by their modern-day heirs, the Royal Shakespeare Company.
And as for the man himself, gentle Will, if you ask me, he's still the greatest Briton. And a special thanks too to Greg Doran and the company for bringing to life Shakespeare's turbulent and thrilling times with such grace and skill and passion. my state, this dagger, my scepter, and this cushion. And such good humor, that essential Shakespearean quality, which is one reason the world still loves him so much. I think Crab, my dog, is the sourest natured dog that lives. I know you've been longing to play this part all your life. <laughs> Sleep, my love. My dove, these lily lips, this cherry nose, these yellow cowslip cheeks are gone, are gone. Lovers make moan, his eyes were green as leeks. Wow. Oh, sisters three, come, come to me with hands as pale as milk. Lay them in gore, for they have shore with shears his thread of silk. <laughs> Come, trusty sword. Come, my breast imbue. <laughs> Thus this be end. Adieu. Adieu. Ah, you. <laughs>